When you think God has deserted you, you may have deserted God. Today, His Eminence, Bishop Omega, offers an inspiring sermon titled, When the Unexpected Happens, Keep the Faith. Be uplifted and blessed. Peace be unto you, saints, and praise the Lord. Welcome once again to the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ of the Apostolic Faith. Today brings us to a very interesting sermon and one which I pray that you'll be educated by and edified by. Um, we're going to visit the Old Testament today because as the scripture clearly tells us in, and please pay attention to this, that in the New Testament we're told that all of the Old Testament writings were given for a reason. And in Romans uh, 15.4 it tells us this reason. The scripture says, for whatever things were written before, meaning in the Old Testament, were written for our learning, that through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, we might have hope. That's what it's saying. And also we have in uh, 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter and 11th verse, it tells us something else about, well, further about this, what the Old Testament scriptures are for. Now all these things happen, meaning things that happen in the Old Testament, things that are recorded from Genesis to Malachi, the Old Testament scriptures. It says, now all these things happen to them, to those people in there, as examples. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come, meaning because we're living in the last times, is written for us to learn from these. So the reason I read that, those two scriptures first, Romans 15, 4 and 1 Corinthians 10, 11, is that when we visit and learn from and explore and go through these scriptures and bring out the various points in, them, in the scriptures, it's for a reason. And the scriptures through Paul clearly told us there in Romans and in 1 Corinthians is to teach us, is to admonish us, is to strengthen us, is to let us see that these were examples. What we're covering today is a very important, well, well-known story, but it's a very important one because I'm dealing with a topic today that has touched each and every one of us at some point in our lives, and based on letters I get even today, and especially in these challenging times, it touches a lot of people today. People are often faced with the problem of their faith, and some lose faith or become despondent about the whole idea of living a righteous life or keep maintaining your faith, and as a result, of challenges in our lives, people often become despondent. And we often, and I'm sure every single one has dealt with this at some point in your life, if you are a child of God, you've dealt with this at some point. You've come to the point where you feel, uh, I quit, I've had enough, what's the purpose? And especially when you're faced with either sickness, financial problems, family problems, problems in life in general can challenge your faith. It can challenge your resolve to maintain your faith. And as the scripture tells us, these examples that we have of these men and women in the Old Testament, they're not just there to give us a good story. It's not just there to tell us about battles and, and things that happened and nothing further. There's a deeper meaning, and today we're going to cover one of those. And the primary reason I'm using this one is because the example that we're using is one of the mightiest saints of God, one of the mightiest prophets of God, and I use the word mighty because God did mighty things through him. He, as uh, James tells us, Elijah, who we're covering today, was a man just like us, of like passions as we, just like us. But God used him for mighty things, so he's often called a mighty prophet. And he is actually one of the mightiest prophets or saints of God in all of the recorded history of the Bible. Now, if Elijah can be challenged, and if his faith can be tested, then I think it's worth examining what are the causes of this? What are the causes of someone coming to the point that says, oh, I quit? And especially after God did a wonderful and powerful and mighty thing through you. Or maybe he healed you. Maybe he healed your mother that you've been praying for. Maybe God, whatever God did, uh, was really strong and powerful in your life. And yet after that incident, for some reason, something causes you to lose faith or come up with the I quit, so I had enough, or that's it. And there's a reason why this happens. And let me just jump ahead and say, that despondency or that sense of I quit, it always comes 
for certain, uh, because of certain reasons. And the number one reason is the reason Jesus kept telling us over and over not to do. He said, fear not. When fear enters in, that's when we begin to depend on our own human adequacy and not the adequacy of Jesus Christ. And when that happens, you're going to see what happens uh, here with Elijah. But when that happens to us today, when we don't reckon on the adequacy of God, but rather reckon on the adequacy of ourselves, you're always going to fail. And as I said, we're dealing here with a mighty man of God. In fact, he's one of two, one of two human beings seen in the Old Testament and the New Testament. You remember the account of Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration, seen with Jesus and Moses? Only Moses and Elijah, the two characters that are seen both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Of course, we're not talking about Jesus because he was not yet incarnate as Jesus, the Son of God. Though I know about his appearance in this, as the Spirit, I know the Word was always there. We got that, the rock, he was that rock that, they, that the water gushed from. Metaphorically, Jesus was that rock that the Spirit poured, so we got all that. But in terms of an actual human being that was birthed through a woman, only two characters appear in both the Old and the New Testament. That's Moses and Elijah. So Elijah's clearly one of the most powerful men of God. And this most powerful, one of these most powerful men of God, we're going to see how human he was. Why James tells us in James 5, 17, he was a man of like passions as we. But yet when he prayed and then the rain came, but his point was that Elijah was as human as the rest of us. So he's an excellent example to use today to examine why is it that after someone has had a close relationship with God for many years, God has done powerful works through him. God has shown him that he is real. God has shown him that he delivers. What is it about a human being? What is it about us? And I get your letters, everyone deals with this, where you can get so despondent sometimes, you feel like, oh, I quit, I had enough. We're gonna examine that today. And to, in order to do that, now my main text today is in 1 Kings, the 19th chapter, one through 18, but in order to get to understand when we get there, let's do some background so we can see some of the mighty work of this uh, Elijah that, that God used, this powerful and mighty prophet of God. And for those of you that are familiar with the story, bear with me, but for those that may not be, open up your ears today and let's listen. I want you to, first of all, see how God used him and that Elijah knew God was going to come through for him. It's, to set the stage, it's Elijah versus 450 false prophets. One Elijah, of course God is with Elijah, so it's already, you know who's going to win. But it's Elijah as a human versus 450 other human beings. So this is a standoff, and I'll give you some background. Elijah's ministry was to the northern kingdom called Israel. The southern kingdom, of course, was called Judah. Israel, after Solomon's uh, son took over, Israel had no good kings. All of them were wicked and evil. In this day, Ahab was a wicked king who was married to a princess, uh, uh, Jezebel, whose father was a king, but they're both wicked. And all of the northern kingdom of Israel, primarily, not all of, primarily the majority of the northern kingdom of Israel were, were wicked and against God. Now, all the kings were, but all of the people there, the majority of the people there were as well, but not all, as we'll see later. But in general, the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom of the divided kingdom of the united Israel, when it became divided, the northern kingdom became known, known as the kingdom of Israel. They're primarily just wicked, following other gods. That's the one sin God hates the most. They had other gods in their lives. They were following, and this one wicked uh, belief in this god Baal, he's no god, of course, of people in their mind, so it's called a false god, small g. With this worship, is associated a lot of sexual immorality. And this was now pervasive throughout the northern kingdom of Israel. Elijah's preaching against it. And he's trying to turn the people back to God. He's zealous for God. He's jealous for God. He wants God's word to be pervasive over all the people, but the people are not following him. And the people are so wicked now, in general, that it comes down to a challenge between the prophets of Baal, false 
priests, the false prophets, and God's prophet, Elijah. So it comes to this where there's a meeting on, the Mount, on Mount Carmel, and we're going to see whose God is real. That's what it comes down to. So I'm going to pick up here in the 18th chapter of 1 Kings at the 20th verse. So Ahab sent to all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you halt or falter between two opinions? If the Lord God, if the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. Now listen to this, very important. But the people answered him not a word. Now you can see how pagan, how wicked the people have become because nobody stood up and said, the Lord, he is God. They were, just, they were all quiet. Elijah says, if the Lord is God, then follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. And all the people of God who should have said, the Lord is God, they said not a word. That goes to show you how influenced they were, how pagan now they are, and how corrupted their spirits and their minds and their morals are that they wouldn't even speak out against Baal and speak up for the Lord God. They, just, they were all quiet. So this shows you how wicked the people in general had become. They said, they answered them not a word. They answered Elijah, not a word. Verse 22, 1 Kings 18. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left the prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore, let them give us two bulls and let them choose one of the bulls for themselves, cut it in pieces, and lay it on the wood, and put uh, no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bull, and lay, lay it on the wood, and put no fire under it. Then you call on the name of your gods, small g. He's saying, he, Elijah knows there are, there are none. But he says, you call on your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who, and notice that capital, and the God, because he knows God is going to answer. Notice the other gods, when he says gods, that's a small g. But he says, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God, capital G, meaning we know God's going to end. This is Elijah talking. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. Now the people, so all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Do you see, after Elijah says, here's what we'll do to prove who is God. Then the people said, okay, that sounds like a fair deal. Well spoken is what they said. But they didn't answer him a word when he said, if the, Lord, uh, be, uh, if the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people answered him not a word at verse 21. They, they should have all said then, the Lord, he is God. No need for a contest. But when he gives the conditions for a contest, they said, all right, let's see this challenge. That goes to show you something. That goes to show you that the people were not steadfastly behind God at all. They said, yeah, let's have the competition. Let's see who wins. That's when they go, yeah, well, these little things you got to notice. They didn't answer when he gave them an opportunity to say, the Lord is God, forget a competition. But when he says, let's have a competition and see which God is God, then all the people go, yeah, that sounds fair. Let's have a fight. Let's have a competition and see. That says something about them. That says they were not dedicated to the Lord. And this is what angered Elijah so much. But let's go back to verse, uh, the latter part of verse 24. Uh, so all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose, I like the way he puts them first, you go first. You know, when you're confident, and I'll tell you why I'm saying that, Elijah was confident in what the Lord was going to do. This is very important. Listen to that word I just said. Elijah was sure of what the Lord is going to do. We'll see that in a minute. Choo Elijah says, choose one of the bulls for yourselves and prepare it first. For you are many, you're 450. And call on the name of your God and put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given them and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning uh, till uh, noon saying, Oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. No one answered. Then they leaped <laughs> around the altar which they had made. Now, that's, can't you just get this picture in your head? Grown men, 450 grown men leaping around the altar trying to uh, I guess, arouse their God to, to act. In fact, Elijah's going to touch on that in a minute. So, and so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, now it's important, we, we're going to explain this too. Why, you say, why would he mock them? I'll explain that in a minute. And verse 27, and so it was at noon, don't forget, these are 450 grown men jumping around a cut open bull 
by the way, the custom was that you cut open the bull and nobody adds fire and you know the blood is pouring and all this, so it's a wet sacrifice there, but fire is supposed to burn it. They believe that their God was the God that controlled fire. This is one reason fire was used here. He says, uh, uh, the verse 27 says, and so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, cry aloud, cry louder, for he is a God, meaning he's a God, isn't he? Uh, either he is meditating or he is busy or he's on a journey or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. Now that's important because we must understand this, that in their tradition and in their belief, Elijah did, just didn't say those things. They believed that Baal was always uh, musing on what he might do next, meditating. That's why he, he used the very things that they believed in to mock them. He's saying, maybe your God is somewhere musing on his next action, meditating, or maybe he's busy. And here they believe that Baal was off fighting a war. This is what they believed about their God. This is the mythology they believed. And, or they thought he's somewhere traveling. That's why he said maybe he's on a journey. Look at what he says here. Maybe he's meditating, or maybe he's busy somewhere at a war or something, fighting a war. Or maybe he's on a journey. Maybe Baal took a trip somewhere. Maybe he's traveling. This is what they believed about their God. So this is why Elijah chose these particular things to mock them about. He says, and they also believe that uh, Baal could die and come back to life. So that's why he said, maybe he's sleeping. Go wake him up. Because to sleep is to appear to be dead. So he's saying he used all the things that he knew would really get under their skin. That's why he said, he's a God. Meaning, he's a God, isn't he? He's saying, well, maybe he's meditating, musing about his next action. Maybe he's busy, off fighting a war, as they often thought. Or maybe he's on a journey, traveling somewhere. That's what you say your God does. Or maybe he's dying and coming back to life. So he said, he's asleep, maybe wake him up. This is why Elijah chose those particular things to mock them about. It's an interesting to note that. Then he goes, uh, verse 28, Elijah says, so they, uh, the scripture says, so they cried aloud, and cut themselves. Now this is a tradition that's still done in the Middle East today. It's a certain sect of uh, the Shia Muslims that they beat themselves. I'm not saying that these were Shia Muslims. I'm just saying that that kind of thing still exists in the Middle East today where they will beat themselves thinking this pleases their God. And so they make themselves bleed. And the more, and the, before we Christians jump on them too much, there was a time around the Martin Luther era where a lot of the Catholic priests would beat themselves thinking God wants you to self-punish to show your contrition. So people often misconstrue what it is that actually pleases God, in their case, their gods. But they thought to self-mutilate and to beat themselves would please their God and really make him come alive and speak to them and dry up this burnt offering and show who is God. Who sends down fire from heaven? He is God. So verse 28, they cried aloud and cut themselves, as was their custom, uh, with knives and lances uh, until blood gushed out on them. Right? Then we're verse 29. And when midday was past, they prophesied until the, uh, the time of the evening. So this thing went on until evening, till the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid them any attention. There was no answer. I'm reading the modern King James Version. I believe the classical reads, what is it, uh, 1829, nor uh, any that regard it, meaning no one paid them any attention. In other words, none of those false gods, and the false god didn't answer and didn't even pay them any attention because we know they don't exist. But this is the scripture making it clear. There was no voice, no one answered. Then Elijah uh, said to all the people, come near to me. So all the, we're at verse 30 of chapter 18, 1 Kings. So all the people came near to him. And he prepared the altar of the Lord that was broken down. That's another thing. The altar of the Lord was broken down. You see how they just neglected God? In the northern kingdom, they had become so pagan and so against God that Elijah felt like he was the only one that still loved God in this kingdom. And with this wicked king Ahab and his queen Jezebel on the throne and, and promoting all the wickedness of this false uh, worship, the false god worship, Elijah felt he was the only man that silly really loved God. We'll get to that in a minute, though. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Then he's just saying that that's the God we're talking about, the one that told Israel, your name is no longer Jacob, now it's Israel. 
Then with the stones, uh, he built an altar in the name of the Lord and made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two seas uh, of seed, meaning about four gallons. And he put the wood in order, cut the bulls in pieces and laid, uh, laid it on the wood, cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood and said, fill your water pots with water and pour it into the, pour it on uh, the burnt offering and on the wood. Then he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a, thir a third time. What we're getting at here is Elijah said, not only am I going to do what the other 450 prophets of Baal did by just cutting the bull and letting the blood be its wetness, because we want to see who's going to dry this thing up, what God is going to answer from heaven with fire and burn this offering. Elijah said, make it really, really, really watery. So he said, three times, throw water on it. Oh, put some more on it. Put some more on it. And so the water ran all around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. So there's water everywhere all around this cut up, cut up bull that's there for the sacrifice. And it came to pass, verse 36, and it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant, and listen to this, saints, and that I have done all these things at your word. That's very crucial that you pay attention to that at verse 36. He says, I've done all of this because you told me. What we're getting at here, what, is our, what are we focused with on today? Why people get despondent, why you lose faith, why you get the I quits, why I had enough, why you feel sorry for yourself after you've had an experience with God, after God has shown you. Listen to this and keep this in mind for when we get to chapter 19, which we'll try to do expeditiously. He says, show this people that I've done all this at your word. Here is crucial to why people lose faith. Once you know what God is going to do, you can have a lot of faith. But when that time comes when God acts like you didn't expect, or you think he's not acting at all, that will often lead to fear or lack of faith, or the I quits will come about, or I've had enough. But you see here, I want you to see at verse 36, Elijah is confident, powerful prophet of God because he knows what God is going to do. He said, I did this at your word. So God's the one that told him, make that sacrifice really, really, really wet. I'm going to come with fire and dry it up. I'm going to, he says, I let them know I've done this at your word. So God, I hope you're getting that. God told Elijah to do this. And this is how we all can be. Once God is doing something we expect him to do, are we full of faith? But the challenge comes when God seems to be quiet or seems not to be acting or seems not to have given us his plan as if he has to. He's God. He can do what he wants. But our faith is on fire for him when we feel we know what he's going to do. Oftentimes when God doesn't act in the way in which we thought, we can become despondent, lose faith, get the eye quits and I've had enough. And we'll get to that in a minute. And the self-pity and self, uh, well, we'll get to those in a minute. Hear me, O Lord. Hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering. Fire from, that's another way of saying lightning. Lightning from heaven is called fire from heaven. Then the fire of the Lord came and consumed the sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust burnt it all up and licked up the water that was in the trench. The actual water that they poured all around the trenches left everything dry burnt up even stones. I want you to see this. So the Lord sent lightning showing he is the Lord God, the only God there is. The others were beating themselves from morning to evening, cutting themselves, jumping and leaping like rabbits around the altar and looking like fools. And these gods, the, the God Baal and his minions don't exist, didn't answer, of course, didn't even regard them, didn't pay them any attention because they don't exist. God comes through here, and not only does he send lightning or fire from heaven, but he also uh, burnt up the wood, the sacrifice, the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. What a mighty God we serve. Now, when all the people saw it, they fell on their face and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Now, that's what the people said when God impressed them with the spectacular. When God came with fire from heaven, now the people are fearful again. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. 
but they should have had faith earlier when Elijah said, why are you halting between two opinions? If you're the Lord is God, then follow him. If Baal is God, then follow him. And all the people kept silent. But now that God gave them something spectacular, as human beings often are impressed with, God gave them this spectacle. And now they're, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. But that people can be scared or impressed for a moment. But you'll see that they did not go and overthrow Ahab. They did not get rid of Jezebel. And you'll see that the majority didn't stay with Elijah at this time. Because don't forget, the northern kingdom is wicked. And they are still tolerating and allowing this wicked king. And one reason that Elijah is going to become despondent is because things didn't turn out like he thought. Does that sound like some of us? I'm telling you, everyone listening to me, at some point, you probably have dealt with this, especially if you are a true believer. When God doesn't seem to heal the cancer you thought he was going to heal, when God doesn't seem to give you the job you prayed for, the spouse you wanted, the whatever it is, when God doesn't act in accordance with what we think he should do, then we begin to uh, uh, experience despondency or we lose faith in God. And here is an example of it. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them and Elijah brought them down to the brook, uh, uh, to the brook Kishon and executed them there. Now I want to jump on to verse, to chapter 19 because, okay, we'll see that the fire came, the drought ended. So the people should all be in line with God. And you can read those intervening scriptures yourself from verse 41 to 46. But I want to pick up here at uh, chapter 19, 1 Kings 19, where we're, we're going to see that, this, and this is our main text, by the way, today, we're going to see that this mighty pro- prophet, Elijah, who James tells us in James 5, 17, he's a man just like us with like passions, just like us. And that's why I'm using Elijah to say, God just used him for a mighty work. He just won the contest on Mount Carmel. And then he, the people seized those 450 wicked prophets of Baal in accordance with Elijah's orders and killed them because they were uh, desecrating the name of the Lord and leading God's people, Israel, astray to follow after paganism. So the Lord, in cleaning up his nation, had them get rid of these prophets of Baal. Now, there you saw at verse 36 of chapter 18, 1 Kings, that Elijah knew what God was going to do. So Elijah is in full strength, full faith, because he knew. He says, Lord, let them know that I did this at your word, what you already told me. So when God acts within our expectations, what we thought God was going to do, we're all gung-ho for him. When God heals us, we're all gung-ho for him. But what happens when God seems to be doing nothing, when he seems, seems to be quiet, when he seems not to be acting in conjunction with what we desired, what we prayed for? Why do you lose hope? Is he not still God in control and omnipotent, all-powerful, able to do whatever he wants, when he wants, for his own purpose, Elijah? Look at this. And Ahab they have told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, Also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Uh, Then Jezebel, (laughs) you'll notice throughout this story, these accounts of Jezebel and uh, Ahab, that he he seems to be the one that's the weaker of the two. Jezebel seems to be the one that has all the um, the, uh, guts, if you will. So Jezebel, first of all, he goes and uh, tells Jezebel what Elijah did. The king tells the queen, what the prophet did. And here's what Jezebel says. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah uh, saying, let the gods do to me and more so if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Meaning if I don't kill you like you had those prophets of Baal killed by tomorrow, let the gods do worse to me. This is what Jezebel has just sent message to Elijah saying. And when he saw that, meaning when Elijah heard this, he arose and ran for his life. What's the first thing that happens? Or what is one of the first, this is the first sign of a lack of faith. Fear comes in. He he got up and ran. And I want you to see something here, saints. Fear, though it's the first thing that he manifested, it's the first characteristic of loss of faith, fear. But you'll notice other characteristics we're going to cover 
in this next passage. Watch this. Uh, and uh, when he saw this, when Elijah heard about what he, uh, Jezebel said she's going to do, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba. That's at least 100 miles, 80 to 100 miles from Mount Carmel, south. He, he went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, meaning in the southern part of the whole state of Israel. The northern kingdom was to the north, Israel. And as I said, I keep, it may sound confusing because the whole United Kingdom was called Israel, but when they divided, the ten tribes to the north became known as Israel, and the southern two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, became known as Judah. So don't get confused when you hear Israel, Israel. So he ran for his life scared, fearful. This mighty man had just defeated 450 prophets of Baal. A woman said, a woman, Jezebel, the queen said, I'm going to get you, and if I don't, may the gods do worse to me. This mighty prophet Elijah, James, told us he's a man just like us. But when his faith waned, he got up and ran. Now, I want you to see something that happens when you lose faith. The first characteristic we see here is fear. He got up and ran. And even with us today, when we begin to lose faith, it's fear of something. Fear that uh, God won't come through. Fear that uh, uh, what you prayed for, you won't get. Uh, then another thing that happens, though, you become unreasonable. Listen to this. Uh, verse 4. But he, uh, let, let me read 3 again. And when he saw this, he, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. So Elijah goes on by himself. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. So he goes off into the desert of Beersheba and sat down under what we call a broom tree or a juniper tree. And he prayed, now listen to this, he prayed that he might die and said, it's enough. That's the I quits. It's enough. I had enough. Now look at, look at this. It's enough, he said. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. I want you to see something here. Here are the characters, some, some, at least five, characteristics of a loss of faith. The first element that you see entered here, in here was fear. Fear only comes when you're not reckoning on God's adequacy to provide or to protect. You're now reckoning on your own ability, Elijah, whoever you are, and not that God's got things at hand. Because Jesus said, fear not, over and over, be not afraid, don't fear. We're not allowed as Christians to fear. Because fear is saying, I don't trust that God has this thing under control. We're in an election season now. Some people are losing their minds about who might win, who might not win. And I keep telling people over and over, whoever wins or loses, don't you know it's in God's hands? You say, but we vote. Mm -hmm. And who controls the outcome of the vote? By the way, I encourage everybody to vote. Go vote this season. But let me just tell you this. When you demonstrate fear, what you're saying is in some way, God doesn't have control of the situation. If God does have control of the situation, why are you fearful? It must be what he wants. Now, there's a difference in being confident in God and being neglectful or um, irresponsible. I'm not saying uh, I have no fear of paying my rent. If it doesn't get paid, it doesn't get paid. Then you're going to be homeless. If it, that's not what we mean here. We mean get a job, pay your rent. But to have fear, that's why Jesus said be fearful for nothing. He didn't say don't, don't get a job. He didn't say don't pay your bills. He didn't say don't pray if you're sick. But if he lets you get sick, if he lets you die, amen, guess where I'm going? His point is, why are you fearing? It's irrational to fear. And I want you to consider this. Listen to how unreasonable we get. And this is how a lot of us act. Look at Elijah, this mighty man of God. First of all, he shows fear. You just defeated, this, this is illogical, you just defeated 450 men. A woman says, I'm going to get you. He gets up and runs. He's also, Elijah is also angry because the rest of Israel didn't rise up and overthrow Ahab and Jezebel because he's thinking, they helped me kill those 450 prophets of Baal. Why are they still on the throne? Where's Israel? I'm the only one here that loves God. But listen to this second uh, uh, characteristic of loss of faith, of despondency. Now, I said unreasonables, the unreasonableness. The first characteristic was fear. This is so obvious a child could see this next point. Look at how unreasonable Elijah is. He gets up and runs and prays that he might die. Really? Why didn't you just stay there? Jezebel would have granted your wish. 
See how unreasonable it is? He's running because he's afraid he's going to die. Yet he says, God, I want to die. I hope you see the irony in that. That's unreasonable. That's how we become when we lose faith in God. He went from fear to unreasonableness. Jezebel would have gladly accommodated him. He said, it's the scripture says here, he prayed that he would die at verse uh, four and prayed that he might die and said, now the reason he wants the Lord to take his life because according to Jewish tradition, it's a, you cannot kill yourself because that's like some people believe it today. That's a, a sin that's unforgivable. That's not the Bible. Jesus said there's one sin that's unforgivable. No, you should not go and kill yourself. I'm just saying here's the unreasonableness of someone who has now stopped trusting in God. You say, Elijah stopped trusting in God? Yes, because he did not. This powerful, that, didn't James say he's a man of like passions? He's just like we are. And even though he had mighty success with God in the past, he wants to die. So it's, it's unreasonable that he should ask God that he might die because all he had to do was stay there and let Jezebel find him. She would have gladly accommodated his wish. That's unreasonableness. And look at the, 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 another thing that comes, another characteristic of losing faith, of becoming despondent, of the I quits, I had enough. He says, it is enough. Now, it is enough means that's self-pity. That's, that's saying, um, nobody's had it like me. Nobody understands me. I had enough. Well, Elijah, look at how, again, how ridiculous this is. He doesn't know as we don't know. When you think you've had enough, didn't 1 Corinthians 10, 13 say God knows when you had enough and he won't put on you more than you can stand and in fact, he'll make a way of escape? God knows when you had enough. You don't. God knows what you can take and he knew what Elijah could take. What Elijah also doesn't know is God has plans for him yet to be fulfilled. And here's a man. Look at how unreasonable this is and ridiculous. Here's a man who wants to die who ends up being a man who never died. We know of two men who never died, Enoch and Elijah. If God granted him his wish here, he would have not have fulfilled God's will that he be taken up in a whirlwind and translated, never having seen death like all men must. But Elijah, Enoch, and the, those of the church age that shall be raptured, never having seen death, are the exceptions to that rule. But Elijah didn't know that because he reckoned on himself and not on God. And this is how he demonstrated that he lost faith in God. I didn't say that he didn't believe that there is a God, but now not seeing what God's going to do, as he knew in verse 36, he knew what God was going to do. God already told him, make the uh, sacrifice really wet. I'm going to dry it up. You're going to win. The prophets of Baal will lose. Here, he doesn't know what's going to happen. He, all he knows is he got a threat from Jezebel. She's a powerful queen. He's thinking she might kill me. He irrationally, illogically prays to die, yet he runs so he won't die. You just become irrational when you lose faith. It just doesn't make sense. It's unreasonable. Then he wallows in self-pity. I had enough. Don't a lot of people get like that? Who's had it like it? Look, I went from, from uh, no job, now I got a bad diagnosis. I got cancer. And I got, after I got cancer, then my husband left me, or then my wife left me, or I have trouble. You know, self-pity. Why aren't you still reckoning on God? God knows what he's allowing in your life. He knows what you can take, and he knows what he has in store for you. You don't know there might be a whirlwind of blessing waiting for you, Elijah. There might be a whirlwind of blessing that you have no idea. While God seems like he's quiet and doing nothing, you don't know. Here he is, Elijah, disparaging about the future, and here's God planning for the future. Here you are, perhaps, sitting and wallowing in self-pity at home, not knowing God has better plans for you, whether in this life or the next. Maintain your faith in the Lord. By the way, the title of today's sermon is, When the Unexpected Happens, Keep the Faith. This unexpected threat from Jezebel made Elijah lose faith that God would protect him. So he ran to Beersheba, and then left his servant there and went off into the desert of Beersheba, really to be alone. He says, I'll, I'll hoof it, I'll rough it on my own, I'll, I'll reckon on my own adequacy, not on God to protect me. And that's what I meant by Elijah, the mighty, powerful prophet of God, this wonderful saint of God, lost faith in God. But while he knew what God was going to do, when he expected a certain result, he was full of faith. 
and, and confidence. But as soon as he didn't know, he, he, God didn't show him that Jezebel was going to send him a death threat. So he runs off reckoning on his own ability to take care of himself, reckoning on his own adequacy and not on the adequacy of God. He runs off into the desert of Beersheba and then begins to wallow in unreasonableness and self-pity. And he goes from self-pity and unreasonableness to disparagement of himself, self-disparagement. Listen to this. He says, first of all, he says, uh, I've had enough. Lord, now take my life. Listen to this. For I am no better than my father's. Now he's self-disparaging. That statement means I am no better than those in the past who disappointed God. So he's putting himself down. You see how unreasonable we can be once you lose faith in God? He, he was fearful unnecessarily. God's got you covered. What are you worried about Jezebel for? And then he begins to uh, be unreasonable by saying, kill me. And that's the very thing Jezebel was trying to do. So do you really want to die or you just want your way, Elijah? You want to know what God's plans are? God doesn't always tell us his plans. He says, trust in me. Then he becomes unreasonable. Then he becomes uh, self-pitying. When he says, oh, just, just kill me, I had enough. I had enough. I'd rather die. Now he's, his self-disparagement, I am no better than my father's. He's self-insulting. God is pleased with you, Elijah. But he's saying, I'm just like the, the, my forefathers in the past who disappointed him in the wilderness with Moses and all those who killed the prophets in the past. I'm no better than they. He's putting himself down. See how unreasonable we can become? And the fifth, you're going to see he, he, he wallows, he goes to, I should say, resorts to self-justification when he says, I, even I alone, am left, am left the only one. God says, really? See, when you think God has deserted you, it might be the other way, it's probably the other way around, you deserted God. Who told you you were the only one, Elijah? But Elijah goes there, and you'll see as we get to verse 14. I have been zealous for the Lord God. See, he's, uh, he's feeling now self-justification. He's justifying why he's lost faith. He says, Lord, I've been jealous for you. I've been zealous for you. I've loved you. I've been, he says, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. You can see he's practiced this because he says it twice. He says it at verse 10 too. I have been very zealous for the Lord. Do you see I, what I mean by self-justification? He has rehearsed this in his head. That whenever he thinks about it, he's going to satisfy himself by saying, well, at least I was zealous for the Lord. I don't know about these others, but I was. This is because he's now justifying. This is another characteristic of loss of faith, self-justification. He's justifying himself for being like he is, running from this woman, Jezebel, saying, I wish I could, I, I was dead. Now, how unreasonable are you, Eli? Just stay there. She'll kill you. So you really don't want to die. You just aren't sure of what the Lord is going to do. You lost faith. So you, get, you got the, I give up. I had enough. Self-pity. At verse 10, and I'm jumping a bit. I'll go back. He says, uh, I have been uh, zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken uh, your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. See, that's self-justification. Because he is not the one, the only one left, but we'll get to that in a minute. Now, let me go back and so for consistency, read this. Now, here comes the cure. We just went over five uh, characteristics of uh, loss of faith. Fear, unreasonableness, self-pity, self-disparagement, and self-justification. Elijah fell, guilt, fell, into this category, fell into these categories. Now, here's the cure. And I want you to pay attention to something. The Lord... In the cure for Elijah addresses the makeup of a human being. He addresses the physical, the emotional, and the spiritual. That's the kind of being we are. And I want you to see how the Lord, who is a loving father, addresses this, uh, 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 this man's condition, Elijah's condition. But most of us would jump to the spiritual first. I want you to see what God does in a very practical way. God, first of all, says, he lets them lay down and go to sleep and slept under a broom tree. And suddenly, or then, the angel of the Lord touches him and says, get up and eat something. So what we see here is Elijah, if you appreciate where he ran, he ran at least 100 miles from 
Mount Carmel to Beersheba. Then he went from another day's journey after he left his servant in Beersheba. He went into the desert of Beersheba, the wilderness of Beersheba. So this man is exhausted, and the Lord knows that. So while he's sleeping, the Lord let him get some sleep. But the Lord first deals with, and this is nothing wrong with this because it's part of the cure. He deals with the physical first. First of all, you need some rest and to eat. Get your head together. The Lord says, I'll deal with all the rest of you. But look at what the Lord does here at verse 5. Then as he lay and slept under a broom or a juniper tree, suddenly or then an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. Then he looked and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So eat and drink something. This is often the cure for people that are exasperated. I've had enough. And he's been working and traveling and running and he's tired. He's exhausted. So the Lord deals with the human being. We are physical. We are emotional. We are spiritual. Notice what the Lord dealt with first. A lot of you will probably go to people preaching. No, give them something to eat. Calm down, first of all. You get some rest. Now wake up. Get something to eat. Want a little bit to drink? Have something to water? Have something to drink? Deal with that first because you're exhausted. You've been running and you're fearful. Don't you often see when people are um, excited and uh, uh, exasperated and uh, confused? What do pe- Even today we do this. We say, give, give them a glass of water. People say, what, you need to calm down first. Deal with the physical. Calm down. Get some rest. Now wake up. Eat something. Get something to drink. Maybe you have to lay down again. But he's dealing with the physical first. This is what we're made of. We're human beings. We're physical, we're emotional, and we're spiritual. And look at how God, the order that he does this. I want you to see this. It's very subtle. But what are these scriptures? Romans 15, 4 tells us. It's for our learning. It's to teach us. It's to admonish us. It's examples. And 1 Corinthians 10, 11, to teach us, to admonish us, to show us so we can learn from. This is, this is what's happening here. This is the Lord's cure for Elijah. I know you're fearful. You're scared. You're running. You're irrational. You're self-pitying. You're self-disparaging. You're even self-justifying. The Lord says, hold on. Get it together first. Get some rest. Now, wake up, eat something, drink something. And watch this. He goes back. The Lord, the Lord lets him rest again. So if you will, the Lord puts him to sleep again. Get some rest. Get it together first. Now you can think more reasonably. But I said it earlier, a lot of us will say, oh, you got to get to the spiritual first. That's not what God does here. God says we first have to get this person together. And in a practical sense, just calm down. Eat something. When you're going through stuff, through troubles in life, saints, oftentimes just get a good meal, drink something, and get some rest. Notice he goes back to sleep again. After the the Lord provided a baked cake with some water, and so he ate and drank and lay down again. What is the Lord doing here? Getting him physically better. Get yourself better first. Right, Elijah? Here's what you need because you're, you're irrational. You're unreasonable. You're illogical. You're self-pitying. You're fearful. All unnecessary. The Lord is saying, rely, reckon on my adequacy, not yours. But this is the cure. The Lord sent this angel. He touched him and he says, Eat, rise, get up, eat something. And then he looked and there at his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise. And you see how the Lord is feeding him? Rest, feeding him, rest. Get it together first. And now look what the Lord says. I have something for you to do. First of all, your ministry is not over yet. I need you to anoint Elijah. I need you to anoint a king of Syria. I need you to anoint a king of Israel. I'll take care of those rebellious uh, Israelites that uh, don't uh, properly respect me. God is saying, I got this. You think I'm doing nothing. Isn't it like that in our lives? When you think, and I've learned this, when you think God is not at work, he's quietly at work. And when you're expecting him to come through with spectacle and change things and and just uh, break the earth and crack crack the earth and a, a, a hurricane and lightning from heaven, and the Lord says, I'm that quiet voice inside of you talking to you. But let's look at how he progresses. That was the physical. The Lord just took care of the physical. He said, arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. Oh, what what journey? The one I'm about to have you go on. So the Lord is going to take Elijah from the desert of Beersheba to Mount Horeb, another word for Mount Sinai. 
Now, this is dealing with the emotional. He knew, the Lord knew, that by taking Elijah to Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai, what would happen in Elijah, he would be reminded of all the great things that happened there. The law came there. God was there. The people were impressed there. He knew of all of the emotional uh, impact this would have on Elijah or any Jew, any Israelite, to be taken to Mount Sinai, that great Moses experience. He knew all of that would come to mind. So you see how now he's dealing with the emotional. He first dealt with his physical. Eat something. Drink something. Go rest again. Now, you need it. Why, why did I tell you to do that? Because you're going to need it for your journey. It's too, the journey is too great for you because it's about 200 miles. Appreciate this. From where he was in the desert of Beersheba, Beersheba to where he's taking him to Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. It's known by two names. So he arose and ate and drank. And, and uh, he went in the strength of the food, the food strengthened him, 40 days and 40 nights. It took him 40 days and 40 nights to travel 200 miles roughly. Till he ends up where? Uh, at 40 nights, as far as Horeb, Mount Horeb or Mount uh, Sinai. The Arabs call it uh, Jebel Musa, meaning the mountain of Moses. He took him there and he says, and there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Again, he wants him to realize, why do you think I have you here? What are you doing here? He wanted him to realize all the various things that happened. It's the place of holy memories. Think about where you are. You are the place that reminds Israel of God's power and grace, where Moses stood before the rock and the water gushed out. He's reminding him of all these things that would eat, uh, um, that would uh, build up in him his emotion where he would feel this is God's place. So he's dealing with him emotionally now. This is how we're made up. We're made up physical, of the physical, the emotional, and the spiritual. And then he says, uh, I have been, here's Elijah again, still feeling sorry for himself. God said, what are you doing here? He's still uh, trying to self-justify. He says, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. And the children of Israel have forsaken your covenants and turned uh, torn down your altars and uh, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. He still is kind of feeling sorry for himself. Although the Lord now is going to deal with him spiritually. Now, why do I say spiritually? Because now is when the Lord shows up. The Lord says, this is uh, verse 11. In fact, let me finish this. He says, I am, in, in the verse uh, 10, I alone am left and they seek to take my life. Then he, the God, then God said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. Look at, look at this. Now, this is done for a reason. Elijah was expecting the Lord to come in a great hurricane, great force of some kind and punish the people. He expected them to quake them at their heels and shake them back into righteous thinking. He expected him, the Lord to come, Elijah, expected the Lord to come with fire from heaven and pronounce judgment on this sinful people. But the Lord showed him that all those things that you were expecting, that's not how I'm going to show up. The most powerful force on the planet is that still small voice that speaks to your conscience. And he's saying, that's how I'm going to speak to the Israel that I'm going to save. That's how I'm going to talk to you. Though you, Elijah, would have been, and I'm sure Elijah was not scared of these, the hurricane, the earthquake, and the fire, because Elijah's used to the Lord coming in a spectacular way. But what shocked and got his attention was that still small voice. And here's where God himself manifests himself to Elijah. This is the spiritual part of him being touched. He says, behold, the Lord passed by and a great storm, uh, and a great strong wind tore into the uh, mountain and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. Again, Elijah would have been and was expecting the Lord to act in those spectacular ways. But the Lord didn't. The Lord came in a spiritual way in that still small voice as he touches each of us today. When, he, when we would be quiet and stop forcing our own will and listen to what that still small voice is saying. That's more powerful than the hurricane, it's more powerful than the earthquake, and it's more powerful than fire from heaven. It's God himself. 
It's that still small voice inside of you talking to you. How many of us drown him out? Because we want our way and the Elijah in us wants to rule and wants to run and wants to be fearful and wants to self-pity. And the Lord is saying here, if you would only be quiet and know, I have yet more ministry for you. What you're going through, I allowed it. What you're dealing with, I allowed it. But you're stronger than you think you are when you reckon on my adequacy, God is saying, not on your own. Don't be fearful of a Jezebel in your life or any other threatening force. The Lord says, I have you. And if you are truly mine, reckon on my adequacy, not yours. Fear only comes to believers when we stop reckoning on the Lord's adequacy, his ability. We have to not reckon on ours. Don't run. You see, Elijah said, let me handle this myself. I, I know how to get rid of this fear. I'll run. That's illogical. You're running because you're fearful. So he's thinking, let me run to safety. And the Lord was saying safety was with you all the time. I'm with you. Just because I didn't tell you what I'm doing, don't lose faith. When the unexpected happens, keep the faith. The Lord is saying, I don't always tell you, verse 36, 1 Kings 18, I don't always tell you what I'm going to do. It's the same it is with us today. The Lord doesn't have to, nor does he always tell us what he's going to do. The Lord is saying, where is your faith in me? God, he's saying. Where's your faith in the Lord to come through? The Lord is saying, if I let you go through something, that's my will. I can deliver you, though. Little did Elijah know, not only would he be delivered, the Lord had a plan for him that he did not even see. Other than Enoch, who else has been translated straight to heaven, never having seen death? Elijah, had you gotten your wish, what you were praying for, it says he prayed that the Lord might kill him. Had he gotten his wish, he would have never anointed Elisha, who became more powerful than he, and it was the Lord's will, nor would he have ever been translated, never having seen death. The man that wanted to die never died because it was God's will. That's why we have to reckon on God's will, reckon on his adequacy, and reckon on his omniscience, his all-knowing. He knows what's down the line for us. And while he may not seem to be doing anything, while you are sitting there disparaging and fearful of the future, God was planning a future for Elijah he had no idea would be so glorious. Who knew a chariot of fire and horses of fire would come and escort him in a whirlwind to heaven to see God himself? Who knew that? But had he got his wish? This is why when the Lord says, pray whatever you will according to my, in, in my name, that means pray whatever you will in accordance with his will. Because here is Elijah praying that the scripture says that he would die. Had God given him what he wanted, he would not have got what God had for, in plan for him, which was never to see death. So when God doesn't answer us according to what we pray, are we praying in accordance with God's will? That's why whatever you ask, and I get your letters. Bishop, please pray for my sister. Bishop, pray for me as if I have some, some uh, power to direct heaven. What do I always write back to you and tell you? I pray God's will be done to your sister according to God's will. May your mother be delivered according to God's will. Someone will say, oh, you're just saying that just in case it doesn't turn out your way. Yes, now you got it. Because I don't want it to turn out my way. I want it to turn out God's way. And we saw here with Elijah, who prayed that he might die, God had a more powerful thing for him to be translated, raptured, taken straight to heaven, never having seen death. God had him to anoint Haziel, king of Syria. God had him to anoint Jehu, king of Israel. God had him to anoint Elijah, the prophet to Elisha, the prophet to succeed Elijah. That God would, through them, punish the dis obedient in Israel and thus turn the good hearts toward God. God already had a plan of 7,000 waiting in the wings that Elijah knew nothing about. So when God doesn't seem to be working, let us remember it is God who is at work all the time. When we don't know what God's going to do, we have to learn to be quiet and stop expecting some spectacle of a hurricane, an earthquake, or fire from heaven, but learn to listen to that still small voice in you, which is speaking to you right now if you're hearing the word of God. If you're learning it, it's the word of God. Someone I wrote this week and, and said, um, uh, it was a, one of the sisters said she's learning so much from the word and she appreciated the series in Revelation. I said, 
So in so many words, if you're learning anything, it is the Spirit that is teaching you. Someone will say, no, Bishop, we learn when you teach. No, I said words. When you got it, when you learned it, it was the Spirit that taught you. And it is the Spirit of God <clears throat> in you that is talking to you in that still, small voice. No, I didn't hear an audible voice ever. But it's God working on you, the will and the do. Didn't we go over this recently? God puts in you through the Holy Ghost that's in you. He makes you want the right thing. And then he empowers you to do it, the will and the do. He works them both. Is it for your pleasure? It's for his good pleasure. And when we learn to not try to direct God, but learn to listen to him, we will learn to be directed by him, but we'll learn to listen to that still small voice. Stop expecting the hurricane, the world, uh, the mighty winds. Stop expecting the ground to shake. Stop expecting lightning from heaven. All that is to say some spectacular event when God is talking to you, perhaps saying, be patient, hold on. I know the cancer didn't all leave, but in some cases it did leave. We thank the Lord for all things. It's his purpose. You don't know. God knew that Jezebel would threaten Elijah. He didn't. Elijah didn't. So he got fearful, lost faith in God, and ran. Rather than saying to himself, you know, if she's threatened me and God didn't remove Ahab and didn't remove her from the throne, didn't remove them from the rulership in, in, in Israel, it must be his will. Let me see what God's plan for me is. God didn't tell him to run. Elijah, through lack of faith, ran. And because he knew what God was going to do on Mount Carmel, he was all gung-ho and zealous for God. And he, yes, he is a mighty, mighty prophet of God, one of the mightiest saints ever recorded in the Bible. But I love, and I go again to James 5, 17, he was a man just like the rest of us. So don't beat yourself up. Every true believer has gone through a period of despondency. The I quits. I had enough. These people don't listen to me. They should put me over this church. Why don't these people listen to me? Calm down. Calm down. Eat something. Drink some water. Get some rest. Go read the scripture. Get emotionally charged again. And then get spiritual. Listen to that still small voice inside of you and come alive again for God's sake. And don't reckon on your own adequacy, but reckon on the adequacy of our Lord God. That's the only way you to never lose faith and to never fall into that despondency again. Let me finish uh, what I already alluded to. Let me go on and read it. I believe we left off at uh, 11, uh, verse 11 of the 19th chapter of 1 Kings. Then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord and behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. Uh, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. So it was when Elijah heard, heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here? Here again, he's still trying to rely on self-pity. And he said, or actually self-justification. Actually, he, and he says, uh, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed the prophets, uh, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then the Lord said to him, Go. See, this is the Lord saying, Wait a minute. No, no, no. I still have a ministry for you. I have something for you. Ministry means I have service for you to do. He says, I still have something for you to do. And you are so. Uh, eager to punish those in Israel that won't turn to me. The Lord says, while you thought I was doing nothing, here I have a plan for you to go anoint. Listen to this. Go return on your way to, uh, to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint ha uh, Hazael as king over Syria, because Syria he was sent down to punish the rebellious Israelites. And also you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, because he would turn uh, Israel back to uh, uh, the purity that the Lord wanted in Israel. And he says, and also, uh, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel uh, uh, Mehola, Abel, Abel Mehola, he says, and you shall anoint as prophet in your place. Why? Because you don't even know. I'm planning to take you up in a whirlwind soon. In 2 Kings 2.11, you'll see uh, that it happened as he continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared 
with horses of fire and separated the two of them, that is Elijah and Elisha. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Had Elijah given up on the Lord and not done what the Lord had, in plan, had planned for him, let's say the Lord honored his prayer and killed him. He would not have fulfilled that which the Lord had in store for him. Same for us. When you can't see the future, reckon on the Lord. He knows the future already. He knows the end from the beginning. So Elijah who prayed and don't, Elijah who prayed for one thing, the Lord gave another thing. Don't think when the Lord doesn't answer what you prayed for that you've done something wrong necessarily. It could be God saying, that's not what I want. I told you always pray, Jesus says, in my name. Whatever you ask in my name shall be done. Meaning according to the will of God, the will of Jesus. But here he goes, I have uh, things for you to do. He just told him, anoint the king of, of Syria, Haziel. Anoint Jehu, king of Israel. Anoint Elisha. Uh, to be the prophet in your place. And it shall be that whosoever, listen to this, the Lord says, don't think that the wicked people are getting away, those that refuse to uh, honor me and those that bow to Baal and kiss the statue of Baal. He says, don't think they're getting away. That is to say the rebellious in Israel. He says, don't think they're getting away. Here's how it's going to be, Elijah, if you would only be patient and reckon on my adequacy, the Lord is saying. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Ahaziel, Jehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elijah, Elisha will kill. Now listen to this, Mr. I alone, nobody else. I'm the only one that loves you, Lord. Remember this, saints. Even when you think you're done so wrong, I'm the only one that loves God. Nobody else here understands me. Nobody understands how I love the Lord. The Lord says this, Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel whose knees have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. Those he was going to spare, and those he's going to have help his purpose. So when you're thinking you're the only one, you're, you're done so wrong, and no one else loves the Lord like I do. Remember, the Lord is working when it seems he's not working. The Lord is planning when you're sitting there despairing. The Lord knows what he has in the future. That's why we always pray that God's will be done. So, so when the unexpected happens, keep the faith. Remember this. A man as powerful as Elijah fell victim to despondency and he lost faith because he began to reckon on himself and his own adequacy rather than on God and God's adequacy. So I'm leaving you with this today, saints, for those of you that write in and sometimes you tell me how, despaired, uh, how in despair you are and you're praying for this for so many years and the Lord still hasn't done it. Always end your prayer with this, not as I will, Father but thy will be done in the name of Jesus Christ. Remember that, and always remember, the unexpected may happen, but you just keep the faith. God bless each and every one of you, and I hope you got something from this message today. Go back, go over the scriptures again, and pray that the Lord always keeps you faithful to him and not despondent, and don't lose your faith. God bless each and every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Peace be unto you. I'll talk to you soon, Lord willing.